So I think we can go ahead and start. Um, I just want to be respectful of people's times. And I know it's the evening too. So, well, it's late afternoon, early evening. And so, um, you know, if we can do this efficiently and, uh, you know, let folks have some of their time back, um, I think that's always ideal. So good afternoon, everyone. For those of you um, I don't know, uh, my name is Shirley Torho and um, I'm the director of SEL and enrichment programming. And so in my role, um, I've been responsible for developing um, a lot of our STEM, STEAM and robotics programming. And we'll be working this afternoon with um, Chris Schultz, who is our partner from Robot Mesh to do this training. Um, some of you may also know um, Vicky and Chris Mooney, who are part of our wonderful training team and you know, have been super instrumental in organizing this and will continue to support um, this work as well. So we, I mean, I guess the four of us, but on the on the full bloom side, more so me, Vicky and Chris will be um, some contact people for questions and things like that. And so thank you all for being here. Um, Chris, would you like to, Chris Schultz, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. A little bit about um, expectations for today. Sure. Um... This is actually a very, very nice sized group. I'm sure all of you have done some level of remote teaching in the past year and um, have come to understand or appreciate the challenges that go with it. Uh, I am Chris Schultz. Um, I'm from a company called Robot Mesh. Uh, it's based in Seattle. And what we do is we are a VEX robotics hardware uh, reseller for the US West Coast. And so we do, uh, we sell the robotics hardware. We help uh, schools that want to get involved in VEX robotics competition. Uh, we teach programming and do professional development for teachers like yourself that are perhaps new to this topic or want to get started in robotics, but aren't sure how. Um, and we've partnered with Full Bloom uh, for the last uh, two years uh, to, to create a robotics program. It's essentially a robotics workshop in a can um, so this program that I'm about to go through with you uh, this afternoon um, has no, makes no assumptions about past ability. It assumes you've never seen a robot before, you've never built one before, you've never programmed one before, and you're stuck now teaching a robotics class and you have to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, so I will try and um, remove, bring your anxiety level down a little bit. Um, I think what we'll do here before I go back to Shirley is Shirley's going to work with me as sort of like a moderator. Um, I have a lot happening on my, I have a couple of different screens. I have a robot kid over here you can't see. So my eyes are going to be all over the place. And if I happen to wonder, she's just going to politely nudge me and say, um, someone has a question. Uh, if you can ask your questions in the chat, that is awesome. Uh, Shirley will nudge me and read them to me as they come. If you have something that you think is too complicated, that is just easier to say out loud, then I would just ask that you raise your hand. Again, I'll unmute you and we'll, we'll have it out that way. Um, we're going to get through a lot of material uh, over the course of, I have three hours allotted for this. Um, if you need a break, like you need a bathroom break or a sanity break or to step away from robots for 10 minutes, that's totally normal and fine. And uh, you're welcome to excuse yourself. This session is being recorded. It'll be posted on YouTube when it's done, so you can always come back to it. Um, depending on the progress that the group makes in the short time allotted to us, I may allow for a 10 minute break. If not, we're just gonna try and give you as much hands-on experiences as humanly possible um, today. I recognize some of you don't have kits, that's okay. For those who have kits, you may wish to follow along. Um, there will be places where you can build and try stuff out on the robot. Uh, so before I do my thing, I'm gonna turn it back over to Shirley and just see if there's anything else you would like to add. Yeah, no, thank you, Chris. I mean, I think there were a couple of things. Um, the first one is, you know, I think as teachers, as facilitators, we sometimes think that we have to be the smartest people in the room. And I'm here to let you know that if you don't already know this, for STEM, STEAM and robotics, you definitely don't have to be. As a matter of fact, it's more than likely that many of your students will be much more advanced in these areas. And so that's totally okay. Um, that really supports the approach that we use for our um, STEM and STEAM and robotics programming. So, you know, rest assured, it's okay if you don't know everything. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, your, you, your, your students will work with you to figure those things out. Um, and it's really because of the engineering design process framework that we use. It's really about trial and error and, you know, coming up with novel ways of doing things and then testing them out to see if they work. And then the second piece of it is, even though the recording will be on YouTube, I think on our end, we'll also try to put it in 
you know, our one of our platforms or something like that so that you all have um, an easier time accessing that as well. And so it'll probably live in a couple of different places just so, um, you know, everyone can access it as needed. Um, mm -hmm. So before we, before I turn it back to Chris, I just quickly wanted to go through the contents of our robotics program, specifically from the approach um, and the framework that, you know, informs the way that we do that. And, you know, I won't take up too much time of that because I think some of you probably already have an idea about this, but I do think that it's important to kind of talk through at a high level what the approach is in our program. So start from the current slide. And can everyone see my screen? Thumbs up. Yes. Yes. And so from a very high level view, you know, our robotics program um, is structured um, and, and banded. So we have a grades K to two, grades one to two program, three to five and six plus. And, you know, the training that we're engaging with today is really for grades three to five and then six and up. So the elementary and intermediate grade bands. This is where we use our robot mesh VEX IQ kits. And as you know, you know, the kids come with Chromebooks as well because students spend a lot of their time in um, the Robot Mesh Studio and that's often how they are programming and, um, you know, like telling their computers or telling their robots what to do. And so our kids provide the teachers um, the training, the materials and the curriculum that you're going to need as well as the ro robotics kits, the, the actual robot kits the controller and the Chromebooks that you will need. So for those of you who haven't received your kits yet, that's what um, you have to expect. You know, a couple of questions came in about primary robotics. And, you know, I was saying to um, those individuals that if you, um, our primary robotics program um, is using B-Bots, that doesn't require the high level understanding that the VEX IQ robot mesh kits do. But what is helpful is that we use the same framework and so, if you have folks in this session who will be teaching primary robotics, you know, the first, you know, 30 minutes or so is probably useful. And then everything else I think is pretty intuitive and they can figure out um, on their own. And so our catapult learning um, or full bloom robotics program is really a dynamic mix of short and long-term activities as you'll see. And so there will be activities that you, you're able to get through pretty quickly within a session. And there's some that'll take a couple of days and that's okay. Um, I think we ultimately want to make sure that students understand the engineering design process um, and the engineering practices that are associated. And so what th that does is it really allows them to be able to internalize the discrete steps of problem solving where they first identify a problem and then they conduct some research and brainstorm ideas then they build out models um, or draw things out to um, test out potential solutions. They then actually test out the solution. In this case, they would program their robots to do those things. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, they can go back to the drawing board and figure out where the kinks are, rewrite their programs, and then reprogram the, the robot. And so that's really the approach that they'll be used throughout the program. And you know, as educators, I think that sometimes it's easier for us to think about a one-to-one -one, um, relationship when we think about a problem and a solution. But again, when it comes to STEM and robotics, you know, the beauty of, you know, this approach is that there are so many different ways that students can approach one problem. And so there isn't necessarily some right answer that the teacher has to figure out or that students have to come to as long as their solutions address the problems at hand. And so in the process of learning how to solve problems, students also obviously are learning computer programming and coding, and they get to do a lot of really cool stuff with um, robots that are practical um, as they go through the processes and they learn how to design solutions um, in a programmatic way. You will see throughout the program that we also emphasize the importance of these habits of mind um, as you know, these are the 21st century skills that we've seen support students who are learning STEM and robotics. And so things like flexibility and thinking, um, even having empathy and being resilient or persistent, being able to communicate and collaborate with others, um, et cetera. So these are, these are really the, the hallmarks of good um, and effective teamwork. And it really supports um, an inclusive learning environment that allows students to turn their frustration into innovation. 
And there's a ton of really great research that shows, I won't go through all of these, but that shows why STEM and robotics careers are important. And as you can see, you know, by, by 2018, STEM careers in terms of um, salaries were, you know, almost $50,000, um, pay, we're paying almost $50,000 more than non-STEM um, occupations. And so again, for students who maybe aren't interested in going to college after high school, or maybe they don't have the resources to do so, there are some areas in STEM and robotics where students can get certificates and get trainings and, you know, be able to transition into full-time careers with livable wages. And so for this, for the student populations that we're working with, you know, those are some, some careers are definitely a benefit, especially if, you know, post-secondary options aren't um, as well um, widely available. And so just thinking about the ways in which we've designed our robotics um, kits, it's very similar to our STEM in terms of the approach that we're using. And so if you've taught our STEM program before, you know that um, at the primary levels, there's a focus on gross, the development of gross and fine motor skills and really building student literacy and numeracy skills. Whereas in elementary, the focus is really on metacognition and helping students to learn how to think about their, their own learning and their thinking processes. And we're also trying to foster some higher order thinking skills. And so getting students to move from merely just understanding and remembering ideas to being able to apply what they're learning and to synthesize information to create new products. Um, in the intermediate level, so this is grade six and up, we really want our students to be able to use evidence to inform their work and to support their ideas and to begin to see connections across different um, disciplines when they're doing this, um, this robotics work. And so there's an opportunity to really improve disciplinary literacy and help students make those connections to the real world. And so generally speaking, you'll receive a teacher lesson manual, um, a student resource book, some posters, and you know, this is the general format. Um, you know, it, they'll have different titles, you know, because they're robotics, but this is generally what they look like. Um, the title is in that big gear at the top, um, the unit number, um, you know, then student resource books look like this with a section for students to write their names. We also have some posters that highlight the engineering design process, as well as um, how to be a respectful participant and how to really help create and maintain a safe learning space for everyone. And then the ways of thinking, which is what we call the habits of mind. So that's what I showed you a couple of slides ago. Um, and so for younger students and, you know, younger students won't apply here, but for younger students, the, the posters look a little bit different. Um, they're, they are structured to help. They're a little bit more age and grade appropriate for our younger students, I should say. So their resources look a little bit different, but um, each TLM is structured the same way. And so there's an introduction um, and the lessons are broken down into sessions. And so the sessions are really what we traditionally think of as, um, you know, like w during one class session, you know, this is what you would go through. And I know that this is a little bit different for the summer because some some um, summer programs have longer sessions than others. But ultimately, you really want to take some time to think about, you know, if I have an hour or if I have two hours, how much can I get through today and what makes the most sense so that you're not rushing. You know, each of the teacher lesson manuals also, you know, provide you with objectives so that you're clear about, you know, what the what the aims and the goals are for that particular lesson. Um, we provide some background information so that you have some context for the lesson, um, as well as some group routines um, and ideas for differentiation and how to time the the lessons that are structured in the um, in the manual. And so just a, a quick few tips, you know, as you're preparing for instruction, we always encourage our teachers to read and reflect on the unit overview in the background, just to kind of see, you know, how familiar you are and, you know, should you need additional resources, you can always reach out to us during um, office hours or something like that. Um, we generally include all of the information that you'll need so that you're not having to do extra research on, on your end. But it, it definitely makes the most sense to review in advance to make sure that you're comfortable with how to teach the content. And, 
read and annotate the session overview pages. Um, you know, feel free to write in it. Feel free to use like note cards and stickies to you know to help yourself kind of track you know the progress and how you want to teach different things. Um, and as you annotate the text, um, you know, definitely think about where students might need more support and how you plan on, you know, conveying some of those messages that maybe feel a little bit more complex. I would also say that, you know, there will be some students in your classrooms who are comfortable with these things and have done robotics before. They're they're comfortable with the, with the topics, the themes, and how to do these things. And so think about how you might leverage their skill sets to support you too as you help other students. and you know, how they might serve as mentors, if you will, in the classroom. We do inc include a, a materials list for each of the lessons so that you have that. Um, with, ro with Robot Mesh and Robotics, it's a little bit easier because there are fewer materials than you would need in like a program like STEM. And so generally everything you need has come in the kit already. We just advise you to go through the, the kit um, and check for things like chart paper and markers and black tape for when you're doing activities on the floor and stuff like that. And as always, reflect and iterate as needed, right? You're gonna, the who you are when you're teaching robotics at the very beginning will be who will be different from who you are in the middle and at the end as you become more comfortable with the process. And so if there are opportunities for you to work with your colleagues who also are teaching robotics, do that, you know, talk to them about your struggles, bring your questions to office hours. We will organize some office hours um, to support. And so, you know, always take note of where your struggles may be so that we can continue to support you. And in terms of managing small groups, um, you know, again, we have all the materials that are, you know, we have all the materials set up to prevent um, as much disengagement as possible. Um, but it's always helpful to provide clear instructions. And so, you know, one of the tips that I always give during these sessions is be sure to post the activity objectives um, in a visible place in your classroom so students know why they're doing the project they're doing for the day. And if time limits are included, you know, include those time limits because in some cases it'll help them to work a little bit more efficiently um, as they collaborate with their peers. You know, as you go through the session, you know, definitely explain the purpose of each of the, the projects and each of the activities that they're doing and explain and model expected behaviors as needed. And so if the expectation is that everyone is working in a team and one person is committed to taking notes while the other person is on is in the robot mesh studio and the third person is physically building a robot, you know, be very explicit about that. Um, I do think that with COVID, because of COVID, you know, the ways in which you set up your classrooms might be a little bit different. So I think, you know, it's especially important, probably a little bit more now than ever to be explicit about how you want students to interact with the materials. And also provide your students with a list of what it looks like to be working in a successful environment. And so what are the look for's, right? Like what should stu each student be doing um, as a sign of efficiency or success? Um, and as much as possible, walk around and talk to students, look at their projects, have them ask questions if need to provide, provide clarifying points or ask clarifying questions to help them think about what they're doing, um, you know, as a way of just promoting critical thinking and inquiry and monitor and adjust this as, as is needed because there will be a lot of adjustment um, throughout the process. And so that's really it for me. I'm gonna stop here. Um, but if folks have a couple of questions, I'm happy to answer them before we turn it over to Chris Schultz. Should be the case that you can unmute yourselves, even though I started you all off muted. And if you can't think of anything now, you all have my email, so please feel free to reach out later. But um, I think the biggest takeaway, honestly, in my opinion, is that um, don't get hung up on finding the right answer because that's not what this is about. Um, that's a that's a huge one. Um, and as the as the teacher, your role is really to facilitate and guide your students to do the work, not necessarily to give them what you think are the right answers. And so I think there's it it, it sometimes takes a little bit longer to get used to that style of teaching, but I think it's it's worthwhile and ultimately it takes the pressure off of you. Um, because your students are really 
responsible for figuring out how they want to approach some of these problems, given some of the um, some, some of the constraints and some of the systems that we introduce. So that's, that's pretty much it. Shirley, will we have a copy of the slides that you put together? They were great, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I can organize um, a few that I think make the most sense for you to have. Just, I don't want you all to have like a bunch of extraneous information, but um, yeah. I can organize like the, ten, the 10 slides that I think make the most sense for mm -hmm. folks to have and then share with Chris and Chris can share with you all. Sure, thanks, that would be great. Thank you.